Welcome to Style Masterclass, the podcast that teaches women to look stylish and feel confident so that they can show up ready to conquer and slay no matter what size they are. I'm your host, Miss J. You ready? Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Style Masterclass podcast. We have a treat for you today. This is one of our special series episodes, Shit My Mama Said, where women tell the stories of things that they heard in their formative years, how they interpreted it then, how they interpret it now, and how that has helped them to help the people that they serve. So today I have a special treat. She and I have been trying to coordinate this for a long time. So I feel like it must be really good what we're going to talk about today (laughs) because it took some doing to get her here. So I want to introduce Toby. Toby, feel free to introduce yourself to the audience and let them know who you are and who you help. Okay, perfect. My name is Toby Fairley. I live in Little Rock, Arkansas. I have been a residential interior designer for about 23 or 24 years, and I've been coaching other designers and creatives for about the last 14 years or so. So just living over in creative land over here. Well, I love that because I think oftentimes, in, in especially I think in the coaching space, there's a lot of like coaching other coaches or coaching B2B kind of things. Whereas People who coach creatives, I feel like they're not as like prevalent. So I love that you have carved out a special place for creatives to get the help they need. As we both know, probably as creatives ourselves, the business side of things, usually we're not that great at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm kind of a, an unusual case. I'm, I call myself the, the like right brain, left brain creative, because I actually, believe it or not, have an interior design degree and an accounting degree. Not that I wanted the accounting degree. If that's for the episode called Shit My Dad Said, because <laughs> he told me to get something that I could fall, you know, fall back on. And so, but I am happy I have it. And I ended up getting a master's in business later. So it has served me well. But yeah, I, I'm with you. So many designers and creatives just really struggle with the business part. And so that's where I come in and help them both with their their business and their mindset. Because like you, I'm a, a certified master life coach. So we have a lot of fun over here with our creatives. You know, and I, I want to pause because I think you and I have similar backgrounds, right? Like someone in our back history said, hey, you should go do this thing, right? For you, MBA and accounting degree for me was go mm-hmm. to law school. But we do have both sides. Like we're multi-passionate and we do use both hemispheres of our brain, which kind of makes us fun anomalies, but it also, I think, makes us better able to serve. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I'm so happy that I have that background. And I really do, in a lot of ways, have a very linear way of thinking in part, you know, certain parts of my life. And then in other parts, it's, it's you know, completely organic and abstract, like the creative mind typically is. So it's really kind of the best of both worlds. And I get to enjoy, you know, helping people. And also then I have that creative outlet myself. I see a lot of people that come into the creative industries, exactly like you, people that come to work with me oftentimes were lawyers or doctors or accountants or, you know, worked in a corporate scenario and really didn't feel like they were allowed to scratch that creative itch or that the job wouldn't be you know, respectable or it wouldn't make enough money. And then later in life, they're like, okay, I'm tired of doing what everyone else said. I'm going to come over and do what I really want to do. And so there's a lot of us out there actually that I think operate that way, but it's, it's a real treat for me to get to be kind of both versions of myself. Yeah. No, I think there are more of us than we think, which is kind of fun. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So let's segue to like, we know we have a hint of something your dad told you. Tell us of some shit your mama said when you were younger. Okay. Mama, I have the dearest, sweetest mom ever. And in fact, it's it's funny that I didn't know you sooner in the life coach world because she got certified in life coaching with me when I did back in 2017. And she just is a grandma mostly now and supports all of us. So I have a wonderful mom, but like all mom relationships, she said lots of amazing things. And then she said other things that she thought were with the best of intention that ended up having, you know, a different kind of impact on me. So I think the thing, when I think of her, the thing that stands out the most that I've really had to kind of wrestle with and do some unlearning is she had a really strong, I mean, it kind of falls in the work ethic area. And she always said, no matter what, just don't be lazy, be anything in the world, 
be, you know, be, be outspoken, you know, be dramatic. I can support all of that. Just don't be lazy. And she really got that from her parents that were those kind of hardworking salt of the earth people. And she thought it was such a great value, but it really, there's, there's two sides to that coin. (laughs) Yeah. Well, especially I think for women in particular, And that like, because we have double workloads, we have our work workloads and then we have the second shift, so to speak at home, Yes, all the other stuff that we have on our plates to do. So telling us never to be lazy means oftentimes we can never get a rest. So yes, don't know how to relax. Don't know how to sit still, feel guilty when you're, you know, doing things for pleasure. Anytime you're not feeling productive, all of those things. And that was not her intention. In fact, she said, I must have said that to you a few too many times because you took it to the nth degree. Like you're you're way farther down that path than I am speaking about herself. But it's it's kind of been the great unlearning of my lifetime, I think, to learn to reclaim lazy. Yeah. So, I mean, since you did go to like school and get those degrees, how did you interpret that I, that whole concept of don't be lazy, be anything you want, but don't be lazy. Like how did it manifest at that point in time for you? Yeah. So like a lot of creatives, I'm good at a lot of different things and multi-passionate, like you said, have, you know, a lot of different interests. And so it really manifested as saying yes to everything believing I was capable of doing it all. And I think I got the double dose because I was raised in the, I just turned 50 recently. So I was born in the seventies, raised in the seventies and eighties. And we got that message of women can be anything. And so when you wrap all that together and tie it with a bow, what it looked like for me was starting my own business as an interior designer, also having a retail store, also doing Christmas decorating for people, also helping people plan parties. I was buying for my shop. I had a toddler at the time. I mean, it was all the things. And in so many ways, it was wonderful that I've accomplished a lot. I've been nationally published many times on the cover of like the top design magazines, like all the boxes I would have wanted to check. I have have product lines that I designed for companies. I've done all the things. But I think what so many of us learn when we start to check the boxes that the world world would have us check. There's like an emptiness that comes with it. it. It doesn't scratch the itch or create the feeling, as we life coaches would say, that we thought it was going to create. But it does create a lot of exhaustion and a lot of other things. So I think it's sometimes a little confusing because I think, well, maybe it's easy for me to say that I didn't, you know, that I wanted something beyond working that hard because I also checked all the boxes. And for someone who hasn't checked them, I know that's kind of like, well, easy for you to say you've had all this success, but learning to relax, learning to be idle, learning to to stop the hustle and to turn off those, you know, the judgy voice in my head about how productive I'm being. I really do kind of, as I said earlier, consider it like the great unlearning of my lifetime. And I've made a lot of progress, but I feel like it's it's kind of going to be a forever quest that I have to to keep working at. I love that you said that and I I do want to go back a little bit to that empty feeling because mm-hmm. a lot of my clients are high achieving women. They do have degrees. They're high level executive assistants, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're accountants. Mm-hmm. They're creatives who run large businesses like you and I and I think that's becomes the part where usually they come to help get help from people like you and like me yeah. is they've been chasing. They, yes, they check all the boxes on paper. Everything should feel amazing, but there's that weird emptiness that they can't put a finger on. And it's hard to tell someone else when they see all that you've achieved that you're feeling kind of empty and like, Mm -hmm. what is it all for? I don't know if you felt that way, but I know I certainly Absolutely. Yeah, definitely have. And, and there's like this, you know, that thing we do as women that is like, it's a little bit of the imposter syndrome. It's, it's the downplaying of our accomplishments and, you know, kind of making excuses for why we were so successful and I think like the the best friend of that is also the the little voice in our head that says, but you have so much to be happy about and you have so much mm-hmm. to be grateful for. And there's so many people that have less than you. And, uh, you know, how, how does it look for you to, to 
not celebrate your successes when everything that you have is what other people want. And all of those, you know, those stories, those narratives in our head that make us question whether or not it's okay to feel the emptiness, I think. Yes, a hundred percent. I think like Mm -hmm. the gratefulness thing gets factored in and Mm -hmm. It, it gets almost weaponized, and it it yes, I do believe we should all be grateful. I, I don't even don't hear me say that, guys, but do hear me say, and I think what Toby's hitting on, which I think is an important conversation. This is the space where we have these conversations. Is be leery of using the idea of gratefulness against yourself. If the right. idea that like I should be so grateful feels really crappy when you say it, then <laughs> yeah, we know we've weaponized it, right? Yeah. And I think it's about learning that you can feel and hold space for more than one emotion at the same time, even when they're um, counterintuitive or opposites or, you know, it, it seems a little confusing because it's like, okay, I can be grateful and sad or grateful and unfulfilled at the same time, you know, because we're sold this message that you're supposed to be happy all the time. And if you just achieve a little more and then you can make more money and then you can buy a car or a house or a vacation or a thing, like you'll be happy. And and none of that is true. So when we kind of wake up to the idea that we've sort of been sold this lie, this, you know, this myth, for a long time, we think something's wrong with us. And so that's part of, I, I've really championed for myself the idea of reclaiming lazy instead of just saying, and even reclaiming kind of, you know, empty a little bit, like it's okay. But I especially noticed it in, in this hustle culture thing. And so I decided since my mom's words were always lazy, not to be disrespectful towards her, but to take it back and to be able to say, you know, those people that don't work so hard, maybe they had a secret we didn't know. Maybe there's more joy in doing less. And and I, so I, I decided I'm reclaiming this word. I'm practicing it. I'm saying it out loud. I'm teaching it to my daughter who's 16. Not that I, and, and it kind of blows people's minds. They're like, wait, you want to teach your daughter to be lazy? Why not just tell her she doesn't have to work that hard? But I, I said, you know, I say to those people, there's, there's something about being a little more provocative and saying, I'm actually going to reclaim lazy to make sure that both she and I know how to rest on the weekends. And that even though as an interior designer, I'm really good at making my house look perfect all the time. It is absolutely okay. If I choose to let it be in a, a disaster state on a weekend so that I can literally lay around and watch TV. Like that is okay. And so that's been the the sort of, I guess, like manifestation, the other side of this emptiness and this overworking and this productivity story for me is to just plant that stake in the ground of like, I'm lazy a lot of the time. And I'm not only am okay with it, like I'm proud of it because I truly didn't know how to relax for years. Oh, I'm the same way. Even now I find myself, like I'm a fidgeter. And I used to kind of mm-hmm. say that proudly, but my poor husband, who's not a fidgety person, we've been married for 15 years. And I, it was like within the last, I think really during the pandemic, because we spent so much time together in the same room together that he finally was like, could you just sit down? <laughs> I, I relate, right? Right. Like, I, I, do you really need something? Like, where are you going? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Go to the other room. Uh, my family... Room? <laughs> yeah, what my family never understands, I have, a, I have my seven, almost 17-year-old daughter, she's 16, and my husband, who is an attorney, by the way, and we've been married for 20 years. And what they don't understand, but they've just let me kind of operate in this way for years, is that I had to have everything done so I could relax as if everything being done is an actual state you could arrive at. And so I was always like, well, I've got to clean the kitchen before I can relax. And I've got to fold these clothes and I've got to like do this thing for work. And they're like, okay, well, good luck with that. Uh, While they both enjoyed relaxing. And at some point I was like, okay, remember the definition of insanity? Well, it's time to, (laughs) it's time to check that because Work is never done. You should know that by now. And so I finally just literally had to practice sitting in my anxiety with things on the kitchen counter and dishes in the sink while I learned for it to be okay to not multitask. And the kind of the first iteration of that was if I couldn't be working, I was like, 
watching Netflix and on my phone and, you know, on my computer at the same time. And I was like, okay, let's go down to two devices. <laughs> let's work our way to one. But it was like, a, it, I had to take some baby steps to know how to just do nothing because I had just, it was ingrained in me. It was like, it was part of like my being that not be lazy, being productive is, you know, it was like, it was a morality thing. It was a sign of worthiness. It was a sign of good moral standing. And it's some work to, to unlearn some of those beliefs that are passed along. But yeah, I mean, there's that adage, what, like the idle hands are the devil's plaything. Exactly. Right? Yes. So mm-hmm. some of it comes from that. And while we may not have gotten that specific message, we get things like, don't be lazy. And my mom too, like well-meaning. I think one of the funny things she would say is, um, if I'm awake, everybody else has to be awake. Oh, mine too. Like at nine, you know, the, what the latest we could sleep in as teenagers, which is hilarious. Cause you know, teenagers want to sleep till noon, like by about nine o'clock, my mom had had all she could take. And she came in and started throwing open the drapes and like, you know, pulling back the, to the sheet bed covers. And we would all, my brother and I'd be yelling, seriously, what's happening here? And she's like, you know, the day is a wasting. Like, and then, then we had to hear the story, of course, of when I was growing up every single day, I was the oldest and my other three siblings and I would get up and she'd list all the things they did. And it was always, you know, like in the garden and then the house and all the things. And then she would tell us that they, she would be rewarded um, to go to town, quote town, a small town in Arkansas and get a $5 hamburger for lunch. And we, I mean, of course that landed so well with teenagers in the (laughs) seventies. So she's pulling out of bed at nine on a Saturday. Uh, But, and and again, I see it now as a mother, like her intentions were so good. Like she wanted to raise good, productive citizens. Like it all makes sense, but she didn't even know how much of it was coming from the patriarchy and the church and all the things that had influenced her. And it's so clearly visible to me now. It is, it's, it's quite comical. Yeah. But it was, yeah, it was an experience. And I know so many of you can relate that are listening. Oh, absolutely. And my mom does this in my podcast. I want to say, mom, I love you. I know. <laughs> oh, I love my mom too. And she won't be surprised by this, but I'm with you. I adore my mother. She's my best friend. And she also knows that I reclaimed lazy and she probably like is slightly happy and also might roll her eyes a little too. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And we're trying to like now as adults, we're trying to get my mom to sit down. And like when I see myself running around my house, I'm like, oh, my, my mother's child, like any holiday, she's like roaming around the house and then she's up and then she's down and like, Mm -hmm. like, mom, sit down, mom, sit down. So, you know, it's going to take, I think a whole generation of uh, learning so that, you know, the women of your daughter's generation they have a whole different experience of the word lazy than we did. Yeah, absolutely. My mom's the same way. We're like, did you ever actually eat a meal or did you just always cook them? Because like, we've never seen you sit at the table and you're if you're there for two seconds, you're hopping up to get something for someone. I had it quickly. I had a really interesting experience this year. My daughter actually ended up with COVID over the Christmas holiday and I host Christmas and Thanksgiving. Typically, I took those over for my mom a few years ago just to try to give her a little bit of a break. And it was so luxurious. I was, I hated my daughter was sick and she was actually really uncomfortable, but I had the the laziest, most glorious <laughs> Christmas. I think I laid in my pajamas all day. I read a book. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the life. I did. I wasn't hosting the 19 people with all the dishes and the china and the linens and the things which are beautiful. And I love those traditions, but just seeing what it was like to have maybe the option of of maybe not doing that every year, I, I, my eyes were opened. And and like, you can never go back once you see like what a Christmas is with like <laughs> reading and like linger, like taking a nap mid morning. I was like, wow, this is, this is fascinating. Who even are you? Right. <laughs> yes. So it took my daughter begin, coming ill for me to experience it, but I have to say it was definitely the silver lining for me, but it was, it did open my eyes to at least start to question in a positive way. Like, I don't want those traditions to go away. They're beautiful, but I don't want anyone, including my daughter, to feel obligated to carry them on all the time. And I want it to be a choice. And so it was just eye-opening for me to realize what it would be like if I took a hard look at the traditions and the obligations and the expectations that in many ways have been passed down to me as the daughter of a Southern woman who's a great entertainer and I, she is, I am. And, you know, these, this expectation and to really 
kind of like with my beliefs go, oh, I get to decide if I want to do all of that and how I want to do it and how often I want to do it. And it it really kind of blew my mind for a little bit. It, it sort of maybe rocked my identity just a tiny bit for me to realize that that I had options. Sounds a little insane maybe to people who aren't no, from the I South. No, I don't think or, at all. I don't yeah, think it but, sounds insane yeah. at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was, it was an interesting experience and one that I'm, I'm happy that I had. I think what I really ultimately decided was that I don't necessarily want to give all of those traditions up, but I do, if I'm going to, to work that hard and treat everyone and, and indulge and love on people through uh, entertaining, that I'm going to make sure that I take a lot of time off around that time of the year, like maybe literally even like a month sabbatical so that I don't go from like hardworking woman to entertaining 19 people to back to work. But to say, you know, if I'm going to do this and give and and show love in this way, that I'm going to show an equal amount of love to myself. Uh, And that was really an interesting sort of revelation. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's like, I think it's a beautiful place to leave it, like anyone who's been telling themselves they have to do something, even the things they enjoy, right? Like, mm-hmm. Toby, you clearly enjoy this. Yes. But you get to decide how it looks going forward. Yeah, totally. And I, I don't even think I really knew that. And what, you know, my, I always thought my job was to raise my daughter to be the next mini me because I'm kind of a mini version of my mom. And now I'm like, you know, not so fast. Let's just see what she wants to be. And it'll work itself out and it'll all be perfect just the way she decides. Uh, And that was really fun too. So yeah, I think that's a perfect thing to leave people just pondering of like, what do I even really want this to look like? So good. So tell us where we can enter into your world and see all the brilliant things you have done and even just come hang out with you visually because people check out her Instagram. It's gorgeous. Like the colors over there are amazing, but Mm -hmm. that's where I would start people out. You tell people where to find you. Yeah. So Instagram is my favorite place. Um, and I've recently started, um, showing up on TikTok, which has been really fun. That's what happens when you have a 16 year old daughter, but if you want to hang out with her, you hang out on TikTok. So that's kind of a fun place. I'm experimenting with that, but Instagram, I think is the eye candy for sure. Like you said, um, and I'm kind of like the interiors version of what you do with style. I mean, it's, it's bold, it's colorful, pushes the envelope, it's unexpected, it's very editorial and exciting to see, you know, on on camera or in a photograph. So check me out on Instagram and then you can always find anything else we're doing uh, at Toby Fairley. That's F-A-I-R, oh, T-O-B-I actually, T-O-B-I, F-A-I-R-L-E-Y.com. We have a new website that's coming out. It's been coming out for months. It's <laughs> hopefully will be out uh, soon. And if it's not out when people check, they can check back, but you'll know the difference. The one that we currently have is kind of pastel colors. And if you land on a site and see all these bright, bold colors that look like what you see on Instagram, you'll know that we've launched the new site. And then you can find all the other things we do, like our design new coaching program and um, all the work that we do with creatives if you need help in your business and really creating that kind of balance we're talking about. Saying bye to the hustle culture and creating a life you really love, then check us out um, in our design new coaching program. We would love to work with you. All right. And we'll leave links in the show notes, everyone, we've got you. And if you made your way here from our email, you already know we got the links hooked up for you there. So thank you so much, Toby. This was an excellent conversation and we'd love to hear what your takeaways are. So hit us up on Instagram if something resonated with you. And for now, we're out. Thank you for listening to today's episode. To learn more about how to work with me, go to judithgatan.com. Click on the Start Here button to get access to my free personal style class. I give you a quick style win, a confidence boost, and you walk away with the tools to start getting stylish. Who doesn't love that? See you there. Miss J out.